started. All right, I believe we went over uh, most of the Agricultural Adjustment Act. Uh, that was very successful for the Texas farmers. It decreased uh, sharecropping, and the peak farmers who own their own land increased from 39% to 51%. We ready? Okay, the new guard. These are the guys that are in the office once the changes Roosevelt has made. Uh, we had seen expansion of Roosevelt's uh, programs. The 21st Amendment is passed, which means that prohibition is over, which means that breweries can reopen, which means that the uh, Brewery, the Sproxel Brewery, where they make Shiner beer, can stop bottling water and go back to making beer. But in Texas, we still do have the option of being a dry county or a wet county, or a dry town or a wet town. Basically, dry towns don't serve alcohol. And people vote those in. James Allred is elected our governor. He had been our youngest attorney general here in Texas at 35 years old, which is the minimum age you have to be to be attorney general. And he had to deal with the reality of the Social Security Act of 1935 that basically gave a pension to people over 65. Had to figure out how to make uh, the money for our government to pay that. Then in 1936, Texas is 100 years old. So we have to have a party, because that's just the Texas way. And the location that was chosen for this celebration was Dallas. That's where we built Fair Park. More than $3 million was spent on the exposition grounds. In Texas, we also love to brag about ourselves. That's when they put up the travel markers. It was through New Deal money that the San Jacinto Monument was erected, or excuse me, because I gotta say it like they say it in Houston. San Jacinto Monument, which by the way is taller than the Washington Monument. Because it's Texas, yeehaw! And the Alamo of Sin Path was also designed and constructed a memorial to the 186 that we know of who died at the Alamo. And out of all those names, only one actually got a proper Christian burial. Proper Christian burial. Gregorio Esparza. Because his, her sister was married to a Mexican lieutenant in the army, and the sister went crying to her sister, hey, let me bury my husband in a proper Christian, uh, Catholic way. And she said, okay. And so his body was spared. All the rest were dumped into a pile and set on fire. Back in the way back. Ready? Then we get Pappy O'Daniel. If you want to know his real name, it was W. Lee. Everybody, though, called him Pappy. Because of a song that he wrote, Please Pass the Biscuits, Pappy. I mean, this guy was a flour mill executive. Had a nightly radio show, the Hilly Flower Hour. With his Lag Crust Doughboys. boys. 
his platform as he was running for governor was the Ten Commandments. And basically, he was incredible and effect ineffective. But people loved him because he was a personality. Indeed, some of you may have seen a character that was based on Papio Daniel. What? I wasn't supposed to do this. The reason I'll get with Windows 10 if you try to use the Internet Explorer or redirects to Edge. <laughs> Who did that? Microsoft, Microsoft did? did. Pretty soon they won't even let you get to Internet Explorer. I, well then, I don't like them. Any of y'all seen this movie? seen your brother where I've done? I've seen it. Did you like it? Yeah. It's good. It's kind of like the Homer's Odyssey, except set in like the depression years. Anyway, that guy is uh, supposed to be Papio Daniel. So at the end of the day, we got to look at the end of the day. Uh, by 1939, we had reached where we were economically back in uh, 1929, when right before the Depression. But at the cost of incredible and massive government debt. And whereas before the federal government barely touched people's lives, now it is a part of everybody's life. Indeed, every time you get your paycheck, you see a reminder from our friend FICA. So what then got us out of the depression? What we're going to be studying next, World War II.
<clears throat> now I will apologize to you guys a little because this is such a huge point in not only America's history but also Texas's history. Uh, we got to give a little bit of a background into America's involvement in the war. Roosevelt and foreign policy. Now, right before his assumption to the presidency, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was an outspoken internationalist who wanted to work with other nations, but upon gaining the presidency, he is so consumed with domestic issues. Kind of like if your neighbor's house is on fire, you really want to go and help your neighbor put out the fire. But when you turn around to grab your garden hose, your house is on fire. And you've got to take care of your house first. Even though he did approve a global tariff reduction, Uh, and that was basically if you reduce barriers to trade, there's going to be more trade. But he didn't get permission to utilize the dollar to assist in the stabilization of worldwide currencies. get the Reciprocal Trade Agreements Act passed, which basically uh, we were able to give most favored nation status to uh, other nations that, hey, we're going to lower our tariffs against you, you lower your tariffs against us. And we'll have that special relationship. And he also didn't hesitate to use the Import-Export Bank, which is, we're going to loan you money if you buy American goods for that project. And by the way, guys, we use that with China. They borrowed $3 billion from us to build the Three Gorges Dam. And they had to buy all American goods to build it. American steel, American cement. Indeed, GE, the hydro uh, power turbines were technology that China couldn't have. So China has to pay for the staffers that are Americans and are GE employees that work the turbines. Meanwhile, while this is going on, tensions are rising up in Europe and Asia. In Germany in 1933, Adolf Hitler had become chancellor, a position that he was democratically elected to. And after the death of Hindenburg in 1935, he instituted a dictatorship where he became the Fuhrer or the leader. And he blatantly broke the Treaty of Versailles, which was the treaty that ended World War I, by building the military. And he promised to create a greater Germany that would bring peace and brotherhood to all. Well, how did the world react? 1938 was Time Magazine's Man of the Year. <clears throat> Meanwhile, in Japan, Japan had seized Manchuria, which had been a part of China. Indeed, the way they got the way they got into Manchuria is uh, they basically set up a fake accident where they already had taken over Korea, but they really wanted resource-rich Manchuria. So there was a rail line that was close to uh, Korea and Manchuria, 
And basically they got Japanese soldiers that dressed up in Chinese army uniforms and they planted explosives on the railroad bridge, blew it up, which gave the army the excuse, hey look, they're destroying our property, to rush in there. Now, why were they rushing uh, for war? Uh, because basically they wanted to create a greater East Asian co-prosperity sphere, which would be a defensive and economic sphere embracing greater East Asia, and it was Japan's moral duty. This new order would exclude non-Asiatic invading powers, eschew dependence on Europe and America, foster a new oriental culture, and avoid imperialistic uh, exploitive control, and embrace the world with morality, and see other nations as brothers. Guys, that's kind of like America's westward expansion. That's where they were at that phase in their nationhood. We read. Well, we got a problem. We got Germany over here. We got Japan over here. And in between is a whole new nation called Russia. That basically, since the communist revolution, had become diplomatically untouchable. Remember, they had also backed out of World War I while the Allies were still fighting it. In November of 1933, we finally extend political recognition to the USSR. Now, the impact of recognizing Russia prompted protests and the want to a return of isolationism. Many Americans believed we were only preparing ourselves for war. Indeed, Senator Gerald Nye said that World War I had been the love child of arms manufacturers, bankers, and war profiteers, the merchants of death. A Gallup poll in 1935 revealed that 67% of all college students believe that our intervention in World War I was wrong. So what are we going to do? Well, we're going to do about all we can do. We passed the Neutrality Act of 1935 that prohibited the sale of arms and ammunition to any nation at war. It also gave the president power to warn U.S. citizens that those who sailed on foreign vessels to foreign locations that they were traveling at their own risk. Now guys, why would us not selling arms and ammunition to nations at war, why would that be a brave thing during this time? What was still going on? Depression. Huh? Great Depression? Yeah, Great Depression is going on. And we're saying, hey, look, we're not going to create jobs. We're not going to make money because this thing is a moral value to us that we will not do. Now, just because we're being placid, which means peaceful, does that mean the rest of the world is? No. Basically, uh, Benito Mussolini, his Italian troops, attacked the Ethiopian nation on October 3rd, 1935. Basically, it was done so that um, he could fulfill his promise of creating, going back to Rome, to Roman days and recreating that. Roosevelt announces American neutrality and places an arms embargo on Italy, but it makes very little difference. Italian troops had modern weapons and easily overpowered Halle Selesi's 19th century soldiers. Roosevelt asked for a moral embargo where American merchants 
would not sell items including oil to Italy, but trade still continued as normal. And on May 9th, 1936, Italy annexed uh, Ethiopia. Basically Mussolini's 250,000 troops beat an untrained army of nearly a million men, only about half of which had modern rifles and equipment. The chief obstacle they faced was the rugged terrain. But when 1936 began, they used air power and chemical weapons and were able to break the Ethiopian defenses and capture the capital of Addis Ababa. Well, what about Germany? <coughs> Excuse me. The Treaty of Versailles was violated when German troops attacked the Rhineland. That's this right here, which basically was an industrial area that was supposed to be demilitarized. In other words, you couldn't have troops in there. And Hitler goes ahead, moved troops in there, And how concerned were we in the U.S.? Well, Roosevelt was so concerned, he went on a fishing trip. Spain, it erupts into a civil war. With armies that support the elected government and the Republican forces, the other side was supported by conservatives and the Catholic Church, led by Francisco Franco. Most Americans believe the U.S. should stay out of it. Roosevelt sold neither side weapons, but Germany and Italy saw this as an excellent opportunity to test out their new weapons of war and supplied Franco with tanks, planes, and infantry. Indeed, the only ally of the Republican forces was that little lovable European nation that was desperate for allies, the USSR. And Franco's victory in March of 1939 began a harsh dictatorship that ruled Spain for the next 36 years. Indeed, Spain is still trying to grapple with ghosts of his rule. Well, Roosevelt kept us out of the escalating tension in Europe, even though in question he claimed that the choice of profits over peace, the nation will answer, must answer, we choose peace. He easily defended, I mean defeated, his contender, Al Landon, and passed the Neutrality Act of 1937 where all warring nations now had to pay cash for all non-war goods and carry them back in their own ships. The Americans, of course, could not sail on belligerent uh, ships, but it did allow the flexibility for Roosevelt to decide which nations were at war and which goods were non-war goods. In other words, if uh, Germany came to us wanting to buy Greece, 
that we believed would be used for their tanks, we'd say, no, you're going to use that for your tanks. Meanwhile, if France came to us and wanted to buy the very same grease, even though we knew it was for tanks, all they had to say is, oh, it's for tractors. Okay, we'll give it to you. And basically, uh, once again, we're trying to quarantine all bandit nations. Well, then we have the Panay incident. Where you had tensions in Asia escalating with open fighting between China and Japan. And on December 12, 1937, the Panay incident occurred. Where the Panay was an American gunboat that was strafed and sunk by the Japanese killing two Americans and wounding 50 others. Roosevelt, of course, is outraged, wanted to fight back, but the isolationist fervor in America was so strong, indeed 70% of Americans believe that they should be to take the power of declaring war away from the president and Congress and opening it up to the American people. 70% of people wanted that. The only action that Roosevelt could do was he had to accept an apology from Japan and their reparations, where they paid us back for the Panay. Now, guys, could you imagine anything like that happening in, like, the modern day? Like, after World War II? Like what? A number of different things, such as around uh, on Iraq and in the North China Sea. We've had a number of incidents that have happened that have been, we don't want to escalate this, so we'll try to take care of this, essentially, out of court, out of war. Mm -hmm. Well, also, underneath Bill Clinton, uh, the USS Cole was struck right off the UAE, United Arab Emirates, by a terrorist ship that killed 18 American sailors. And basically, America did not want to go to war. They're like, okay, whatever. We'll just accept the money. During, in 1967, during uh, the Six-Day War, the USS Pueblo was sunk by the Israeli army. Because the Israeli told us, look, don't have any ships in here. And we said, okay. And we went ahead and put our ship there for electronic surveillance. And they said, look, guys, we told you not to go there. Boom, boom. Hey, hey. But Israel remained our close ally. Which I don't argue with. The road to war. Ah. Okay, guys. By nineteen thirty nine, fighting in China and Spain is raging. Hitler announced his intentions to join all German-speaking lands back into the German Empire, or the Reich. He sends uh, Nazi agents to go and stir up support, cause trouble with Austria, so he can achieve Anschluss, which is merger with Austria. How do the other nations react, though? Well, they only mildly protest. Hey! You shouldn't have done that. And that little statement underneath the uh, float there, I invoke on the right, one people, one empire. And having achieved that without a lot of difficulty, uh, he next decides to go after the Sudetenland. which was part of Czechoslovakia. And that's where some German-speaking people spoke, I mean lived. So he says he wants to incorporate it back into the right. Czechoslovakia, they go to their allies
spies in France and England, and they say, hey, this, this guy's got a huge military. He's, he's taking all this stuff. And uh, Hitler meets with Neville Chamberlain, that's the British Prime Minister, and, they, and Czechoslovakia isn't even represented at this meeting. And they sit down, they have a discussion. Neville Chamberlain says, you're not going to want anything more. And Hitler said, no. You're not? No. Okay, we'll give it to you. And they allow, uh, basically, the Nazis to take over Czechoslovakia. And, of course, as you can see, not everybody's so happy about it. Now, it was during this time in Germany that they started getting rid of their undesirables. Who are these undesirables? Well, it starts off with, you know, the easy targets. Well, we got old people. They're getting old, they're taking resources that should be used by the young. So, we need to start old people, have them start fading away. Also, retarded people or people with physical abnormalities. We don't want those genes passed on in the master race. Everybody can understand, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And at this point with the Jews, they are starting to confiscate their property. They're not killing them yet. But confiscate their property, sell that property to other Germans for a lot less. Same thing with political opponents. Homosexuals, Jehovah's Witnesses. Well, at this time, a lot of Jews are, they know, hey, this isn't cool, we better get out of here. Uh, some of the immigrants that are totally poor, have no money, they're Jewish, try to get into America um, claiming political asylum, asylum. And America doesn't accept it. Now, a lot of people point this out as, oh, America is an anti-Semitic. Guys, America was turning away people from a lot of other nations. These people had no money. And what was going on in America? It was great. The Great Depression. Where we could barely take care of ourselves. Okay? Meanwhile, you have a building of German strength. They sign a treaty with Italy, forging the Pact of Steel. And Germany, good old Adolf Hitler, who promised he didn't want anything else, well, he found something bright in China. He wanted the Polish Corridor, because basically after World War I, Germany was split, East Prussia was separated, from uh, the rest of Germany, and uh, this land was given to Poland. Danzig would be a port city that Poland didn't have, uh, that would be used by many nations. And basically, uh, Adolf Hitler said, it's not fair that we can't have that land back and join us. So we won it. Well, then to everybody's shock, on August 23rd, 1939, they made a non-aggression pact with the Soviet Union. So, and everybody was, because Adolf Hitler had always talked about how bad communist was. Indeed, that's how he built his power early on, by going after the communists that he said were such a danger to Germany, physically attacking them. Is in his book Mein Kampf, he talks about how that room should be Lebensraum or living room for the Germanic peoples. But Russia thought this was a great deal. Why? Because they saw an expansive power on one of their borders that they now were friends with. And not only that, but a little secret deal. I got a secret. That they made that they didn't tell anybody else was, oh, by the way, FYI, we're going to attack Poland. Oh, and FYI, you're going to get half of it. So on September 1st, 1939, uh, Adolf Hitler invades Poland. Russia does as well. England and 
friends, uh, guys, basically this is too much. And Neville Chamberlain, who had been praised because he won peace in our time, a lot of people now see that he was a fool for trusting a guy like Adolf Hitler. And this is marked as the beginning of World War II. Now, guys, the funny thing is, Adolf Hitler and Germany had all their troops over here. If France, who actually had more tanks than did Nazi Germany, had they attacked at this time, they may have been able to have made huge inroads and maybe even defeated the Nazis, but they didn't attack. Why? Guys, we had just, the, the last big hoo-ha, World War I, uh, basically it killed a third of an entire generation in France. It was incredibly bloody for them. England, they almost lost a million people, 900 and some odd thousand. We Americans, much less so. But we, we were still shocked by how many we lost. And we didn't want to see that happen again. This, have any of y'all seen those uh, posters, Keep Calm and Carry On? Basically, this, that was, after England declared war, they sent members of the BEF, or British Expeditionary Force, over to France, but they didn't want to fight. They declared war, but they didn't want to fight. Indeed, Adolf Hitler was still trying to work out a deal with England. You know, hey, you guys are almost as equal as us. The German kings, I mean, the kings of England had come from Germany. Okay? Meanwhile, here in America, we have very little desire to aid Poland, Britain, or France. Indeed, Fortune magazine, their poll weeks before the invasion of Poland, 54% of Americans believe that no international event would be strong enough to pull in American action. And although Roosevelt proclaimed neutrality, he told Americans that they did not have to be neutral in their thoughts. So the world is burning, and we're doing nothing. <clears throat> and even though we're doing nothing, the Soviets and Germans are using this to expand. The Soviets invaded Finland, and they have incorporated the Baltic republics of Latvia, Estonia, and Lithuania. On May 10th, the German offensive against France begins. Now, the problem had been the Maginot Line, which was this huge line of defenses. I mean, they had spent of, I think, $10 million on this. It had, uh, you know, all these guns. Most of it was underground. Had a trolley system to carry troops from one place to another. All their guns were sighted dead on so they knew where their targets were. It had its own power company. It had its own telephone company. Okay, and they built it right against their border with Germany. But you know what Patton called uh, defensive works? Monuments to human stupidity. Why? They didn't build any up here. Their borders with um, Belgium. So what do you think the Germans did? The exact same thing they did in World War I. But nobody thought they could do it because the forests were too thick. Well, or there's a will, there's a way. And basically, 
Hey Belgium, what do you know? Hey Denmark. They went through the neutral nations of Belgium and the Netherlands, totally catching the French and the BEF, or British Expeditionary Force, by surprise. And by May 26, they had the huge British Expeditionary Force stranded on the beaches of Dunkirk. Now, how many of y'all have seen the, the movie Dunkirk? It's a pretty good movie, isn't it? And one of the things, and the movie does a little bit about this, but guys, Dunkirk couldn't have been possible without the French army and soldiers that basically put up de incredible defense against the Nazi war machine. So the BEF, or the British Expeditionary Force, could be uh, taken off. Basically, at Dunkirk, Winston Churchill, who was the newly elected prime minister, said, every boat that can float, get over there, our boys need to get out. And of course, some of the ships were sunk, but the army was saved, even though they had to leave all of their equipment on the beach. Okay? And a lot of people were scared that Adolf Hitler might use poison gas on the troops. But Adolf Hitler didn't use poison gas on the troops. Do y'all know why Adolf Hitler didn't use poison gas, even though he had it? And apparently he had no qualms about using it on his political prisoners, Jews, or those in his death camps that he did kill, more than six million. Or because they're implying you might as well use against entrenched uh, placements such as the French army instead of the British who don't have any defensive placements on the beach, as well as next to the beach you're more likely to have a wind blowing inland off of the water so it would go back towards his troops. Something even more simpler than that. Hitler had worked his way up to a corporal in World War I. Indeed, there was a British guy who could have shot him because he was a messenger runner from trench to trench. There was a British guy that had him in his gun sights and could have killed him and didn't. And he actually had a portrait of that guy painted and put behind his desk at his office. It was part of his, um, I am the Messiah, I am to lead. But during his experience, in the army, he got gassed with mustard gas. And he was blind for about a week. And he didn't want to use gas at all because he was afraid that if he used gas, then the other side, they used gas on the Germans. So he said, hey, not going to do it. I can kill my prisoners with it, but no. It's not right. Italy, meanwhile, invades southern France on June 14th, Flag Day, and France surrenders. Well, like I told you, in England, we have a new prime minister, Winston Churchill, who refuses to surrender to the Nazis. They're the only guys in Europe right now that the Nazis are attacking, and he basically says, we shall not fall. We shall fight them in the fields. Have you all seen, uh, what is that movie? Churchill, it just came out about him. It's a good movie, you ought to check it out. And on uh, August 8th, the Battle of Britain begins, which happens to guys, uh, Field uh, Marshal Goring, who had been a uh, ace in World War I, was carrying out the plan. He was bombing the airfields and the factories that were supporting the aircraft, and it was making great advances. Had they kept that up, 
They might have won the Battle of Britain. They may have gained the air superiority. Well, what happened? August 8th, a bomber got hit, and in order to stay uh, elevated, it dropped its bomb load. It dropped its bomb load on the town. It dropped its bomb load on London. Well, the press freaked out, talked about, oh my God, look at all the, Hitler saw the reaction. And he said, well, this is how we're going to break their will. We're just going to start bombing their cities. So they moved from a plan that was strategically sound and working quite well to one where now we're just going to be counting up civilian deaths. And basically, you have the Battle of Britain, the air war between the Royal Air Force and the German Luftwaffe, where the average uh, lifespan of a British uh, pilot was 30 seconds. But they didn't have to f waste all the fuel of flying across the channel and using planes like the Hawker Hurricane and Spitfire. Finally, we're triumphant. All right, we'll get to the next lecture.